in order to have a laser, it's really not enough just to have a LED. You know, just to have a junction that is able to convert electron hole pairs into photons. That's an LED, but that's not a laser. However, a diode laser, a semiconductor laser, is made from an LED. The job is done by the optics outside of the LED. So this particular lecture is not going to have any semiconductors in it. We're going to talk about optics in this lecture and how you use optics to control and feed back the light that comes out of a LED in order to turn it into a laser. There are three steps that need to be followed. The problem is that the spectra coming out of an LED is way too wide. We calculated that. You know, it's on the order of 10, 20 nanometers, and that's not acceptable for a laser. You want one wavelength. Of course, you can't have one wavelength since wavelength is a continuum, but we have techniques that I'm going to describe here that narrow the selection of wavelengths down so much that you can get a very bright beam of light out of an LED that can go a long distance without the light dephasing, which in other words, becoming incoherent, and hence being laser light. So let's go through these three ways of narrowing up the line width so that your LED turns into a diode laser. First thing is, is you need internal cavity feedback. The internal cavity is the semiconductor die, the block, the PN junction. So there's the internal cavity. You have type P and type N. This might be a heterojunction. This might be a homojunction. The surfaces are polished and metalized so that light reflects off of them. So the backside uh, surface is prepared so that it has a very high reflection coefficient. So light does not go out the back surface. Any photons that are born go over here and reflect back. The surface on the right is also polished and prepared, possibly metalized, so that it has a reflection coefficient that's not exactly one like this back surface but is uh, you know, high. So photons hit it, they have a good chance of reflecting back and bouncing back and forth and creating a, an avalanche for us. But photons can escape. So there's a careful compromise in preparing the front surface here. We'll call this the front surface. And out comes a photon. And you know, the photon comes out this way because photons like to be directed down the PN junction. Remember, because the dielectric constant of PN junction is slightly higher in the depletion region than it is throughout the bulk semiconductor turning the junction area into a fiber optic that polarizes and directs the photons all in one direction. We talked about uh, the spectral width of it, but now it's a resonant cavity. And so this is why in general physics, we spend time talking about the vibrating string because this is really the vibrating string problem, just uh, in a different form. Now it's, we're talking about photons bouncing back and forth between these two boundaries instead of a string that is tied down at these two boundaries. Otherwise, the same thing happens. You have certain frequencies that you can vibrate the string at and get a, get a corresponding commensurate wavelength, add them up. You can have a wavelength that is twice the length of this cavity. The important thing is the boundaries. The boundary conditions say the amplitude of the vibration goes to zero at the boundaries. That's the, the longest wavelength resonance that you can have in this cavity. If I said, well, how long is the cavity compared to a wavelength, I'd say that the wavelength is twice the length of the cavity. So I might say that the, the length of the cavity is the wavelength divided by 2. And you always have to include refractive index in that. Whenever you talk about a wavelength inside of a dielectric, you really need to divide wavelength by the index of refraction in order to get the actual wavelength. And so that's why the n is there in the denominator. The next one is it going to be a full wavelength. So one, the cavity length is a wavelength. Then the next one, the wavelength is two-thirds, the cavity length. About to having this N here, it would be reasonable to say, well, no, the length of the cavity and one wavelength of this green curve are the same. They're not different by factor of the index of refraction, right? They're, they're actually the same. Yeah, so these lambdas that you see here are free space wavelengths. They're the wavelength that the photon will have after it emerges from the medium that has a dielectric constant into air. So once the photon gets into air, this is its wavelength. And that's why we go lambda over n, because we want to use not the wavelength inside the block, which doesn't mean anything to anybody, right? I have no use for that. I need, I need a wavelength in air. You see pattern here, a pattern in this expression. It looks like, like when m is 3, the length is m, 
lambda over 2n. When m is 2, the length is m lambda over 2n. You see the pattern. So the length of the cavity is m over 2 wavelength over n. Again, that's the free space, the vacuum wavelength. And m is an integer, right? Just m, 1, 2, 3 is actually going to be quite large. Uh, it's not going to be a little number like 1, 2, or 3. And the index of refraction, we'll talk about gallium arsenide today. So n is 3.6 for gallium arsenide. If you take the derivative, pause the video for a minute, and do it yourself. You know, rewrite this as a function of m with m on the left and everything else on the right and take the derivative. You get that. Confirm. Good. I would make an argument here. Each one of these modes, they're modes, right? This, that's what you call them. The case where your lambda is twice the length, where it's equal to the length, where it's two thirds the length, those are modes. Each one of these modes has a different value of the index m, different by one. So m equals one, m equals two, m equals three. DM is no smaller than 1, and, and for neighboring modes, it equals 1. So let's ask this question. How far apart in wavelength are neighboring modes? So you have the first mode, the second mode, the third mode, the thousandth mode, the thousandth and oneth mode. How far apart in wavelength are they? Well, let DM equal 1 and solve. So let, let that equal 1. So I'll call it delta M, I just M. And we'll have this delta lambda, which is what's left. Lambda squared over 2ln. Forget about the m. The dm was set equal to 1. So that's how far apart two neighboring modes are. The sub in t does not describe the lambda. I mean, wavelength is wavelength. It describes the delta. This lowercase delta uh, lambda means a resonance due to the internal cavity. That is the semiconductor block. So we're going to later have an external resonance due to everything outside. So that's what the INT means. It doesn't describe the lambda, it describes the delta. The, the separation of wavelengths due to internal cavity resonances is called the free spectral range, how far apart the resonances are. More frequently, people talk about the free spectral range in terms of frequency instead of, uh, of wavelengths. But uh, here you go, there it is in terms of wavelengths. We talked about the semiconductor diode, the LED and the spectral width of it. We had a whole lecture on the spectral width of an LED. We came up with an expression as well for the width. I call it 2 delta lambda, so delta lambda is half width. It's quite large, way too large for use as a laser, but we can superpose those Fabry-Perot resonances on top. A Fabry-Perot resonance is the electromagnetic version of a vibrating string. If you have electric fields that bounce back and forth between two walls and resonate with a frequency that's commensurate with the separation of those walls, you call it a Fabry-Perot resonance. This is the delta lambda internal, uh, the, the separation between them. When we covered the spectral width of an LED, we calculated it, you know, and we found that it's on the order of you know, several nanometers. You know, for a laser, you want it to be you know, sub-angstrom, preferably under 100 picometers, but sub-angstrom, and not um, not 10 nanometers. Which uh, Let's do a quick little cal back of the envelope calculation for a typical gallium arsenide dye, uh, a length of 300 microns, a uh, wavelength of 700 nanometers we'll work at, and uh, we'll uh, say N is 3.6. Okay, so let's find out the value of this width. We came up with an expression in the previous lecture that that width is 64 nanometer electron volt squared divided by the band gap squared. Band gap for gallium arsenide is 1.8, so put that in there and you calculate 20 nanometers. So this spectral width from the LED is about 20 nanometers wide. Not sure why I said 10 up there, but it's about 20 nanometers wide. That's too wide. We need to have something a lot narrower than that. So now we need to do some optics in order to make that happen. And then the first thing is to say, you know, if by chance we could just get one of these Fabry-Perot resonances to, to be excited, and we're going to have to control that, we're going to have to make that happen, then we would have delta lambda down to this. So you say just plug numbers into this expression that we came up with previous slide. Those internal cavity resonances are separated by this much. So there are this many nanometers apart from each other. Plug in the 700 nanometers for the wavelength and uh, 3.6 for N and L is 300 microns, you get 2.3 angstroms.
So you're getting there. We're, we're definitely getting there. So I deliberately drew this as like just ripples on top of what is otherwise LED background. It's kind of like that. Uh, you get emission you know, and even in these little in-between areas just because of the fact that the LED itself has a, a lot of spectral broadening to it. So we need to get some control over that and choose one of these. And then we'll have something that's that wide, which is still not enough, but at least it's an improvement. But the neat thing is now, I only drew this with, I don't know, 18 or 19 um, modes in there. But actually, if you, if you take this 2.3 angstrom separation between these guys, and this guy's 20 nanometers wide, you do have 87 Fabry Pro modes in this full width a half max of, of 20 nanometers. There are 87 Fabry Pro modes. Even more if you consider the, you know, the tails here. Uh, you, you'll probably be able to see those too. North of 100 Fabry Pro modes could be visible if you were able to step through these wavelengths. We have a technique for doing that. So anyway, uh, we have to select one of these guys. So we need a second method, and that's feedback. So the LED that is putting out this broad spectrum of light, but it does have those resonances, meaning that on certain wavelengths, those resonant wavelengths, the light that comes out of the LED is brighter. So just go back and look. So if I'm at this wavelength right here, the light coming out of the LED is, is brighter than the if I'm at this wavelength. So that's that's going to get taken advantage of here. We're going to set up a feedback mechanism. So you have your diode, and the light comes out. It needs to be collimated because it does come shooting out uh, with quite a broad angle. So you collimate it and reflect it back. So we get something to reflect it back here with. Just think, imagine a mirror. You know, it hits a mirror and it reflects back. Well, it it does and it doesn't, right? Because angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. So actually, this light hits the mirror. It wants to go that way. A lot of it will. You know, you will get this happening. Parallel output light at the wavelength of interest. Yeah. But this isn't any old mirror right here. This is a diffraction grating. We're not going to dive into the optics of diffraction gratings here. I'm just going to, going to you know, tell you an important property of diffraction gratings is that if you look at the grating, say from the diode's perspective, if you rotate that grating, so it's at an angle right now, right? If we just keep changing that angle, there will be certain angles where the light also reflects back at you. So you know, some of it goes out, some, but some of it reflects back at you. Just certain angles. Those angles, it will get fed back in. And only light at a certain wavelength. So whatever angle I choose to hold this diffraction grating uh, at, uh, only certain wavelengths will reflect back. And they're very far apart wavelengths. So basically, as far as we're concerned, only one wavelength will come straight back at us. It won't be a good reflector, but it'll be a reflector. And only one wavelength will come back at us. And it'll go back into the diode. The angle of those has to be just right. So if I wanted uh, a very specific wavelength, you know, 876.245 nanometers, I choose this angle to capture that wavelength. And it comes back into the diode. And now with light at that specific wavelength coming back into the diode, that's the wavelength that's dominating the stimulated emission. So now whenever stimulated emission happens, it's being being done by that wavelength. You, you end up getting an accumulation of photons at that wavelength. And so that's uh, that's useful feedback. All right, so light feedback, well, light feedback. So yeah, we're returning the wavelength that we actually want to get out of this, this thing. We'll do this in the experiment. You'll step through the wavelengths. We'll, actually, what we'll do is we'll rotate the diffraction grating so that we step through which wavelength is being reflected back. And you'll see the light coming out of the, the LED going dark, then bright, then dark, then bright, then dark, then bright. And we just select one. Like you might select this one. I'm just randomly saying, oh, for example, let's select this one. Okay. Uh, but it's still too wide. It's still, you know, we calculate that the width of that. Well, they're, they're separated by 2.3 angstroms. And just considering it to be a wavy thing, then the width of this, this wave is about 2 angstroms. And that's still too wide. Okay, so we need a third thing. And the third trick up our sleeve is to set up an external resonator and use its Fabry Pro resonances. And because, you know, you notice that that L in the, the denominator, if you have a very long cavity length, you get very narrow line widths. 
to set up a, a external cavity by not we don't have to add anything we're going to use the diffraction grating and this back surface of the die which is highly reflecting remember the front surface is only partially reflecting so from the back surface of the die to the diffraction grating we get fabric pores and errors the diffraction grating might be one or two centimeters away from the die so it's a long ways and we'll call it the external cavity and so if you calculate the line width Due to the external resonator, same expression, lambda squared over 2nl, now n is the error, so it's just 1, because uh, you're mostly in error here. We won't worry about the little bit of material that's involved for 300 microns. Uh, plug in some numbers. You know, we're, again, we're just using 700 nanometers as a round number for the wavelength. 2 centimeters, uh, I think I did that right, it's 2 times 10 to the 7th nanometers. Yeah. And plug that in, you get 0.123 angstroms. So, wow, now we've, if we use this external cavity, now we have a, a very, very narrow line width. So let's do, let's do a blow up of a picture. So this, this is the, the LED's broad background is this solid smooth curve here. Then on top of that is the internal fabric pro resonances, which we have selected. Now we've selected this one. And then within it are the external fabric pro resonators that are 0.123 angstroms apart. So whereas this one we calculated is about 2.3 angstroms wide at full width and a half max, these guys will be 0.123 angstroms wide at full width and a half max. That's a significant effect, so we'll, we'll use take advantage of that. Inside of each one of these internal cavity modes, there are 19 external cavity modes. Just go 2.3 divided by 0.123 and we adjust the diffraction grading until we are just sitting on the one that that we want so we'll choose this one and that is the basic idea behind getting the narrow wavelength that you want you're out of a diode laser so I'll show you a video later of this done as an experiment so that you can process the results that we get in that little video.